Moby Dick. Chapter 56. Of the less erroneous pictures of whales, and the true pictures of whaling scenes. In connection with the monstrous pictures of whales, I am strongly tempted here to enter upon those still more monstrous stories of them which are to be found in certain books, both ancient and modern, especially in Pliny, Purchas, Hacklet, Harris, Cuvier, etc. But I pass that matter by. I know of only four published outlines of the great sperm whale, Colnett's, Huggins's, Frederick Cuvier's, and Beale's. In the previous chapter Colnett and Cuvier have been referred to. Huggins's is far better than theirs, but, by great odds, Beale's is the best. All Beale's drawings of this whale are good, excepting the middle figure in the picture of three whales in various attitudes, capping his second chapter. His frontispiece, Boats Attacking Sperm Whales, though no doubt calculated to excite the civil skepticism of some parlor men, is admirably correct and lifelike in its general effect. Some of the sperm whale drawings in J. Ross Brown are pretty correct in contour, but they are wretchedly engraved. That is not his fault though. Of the right whale, the best outline pictures are in Scorisby, but they are drawn on too small a scale to convey a desirable impression. He has but one picture of whaling scenes, and this is a sad deficiency, because it is by such pictures only, when at all well done, that you can derive anything like a truthful idea of the living whale as seen by his living hunters. But, taken for all in all, by far the finest, though in some details not the most correct, presentations of whales and whaling scenes to be anywhere found, are two large French engravings, well executed, and taken from paintings by one garnery. Respectively, they represent attacks on the sperm and right whale. In the first engraving a noble sperm whale is depicted in full majesty of might, just risen beneath the boat from the profundities of the ocean, and bearing high in the air upon his back the terrific wreck of the stoven planks. The prow of the boat is partially unbroken, and is drawn just balancing upon the monster's spine, and standing in that prow, for that one single incomputable flash of time, you behold an oarsman, half shrouded by the incensed boiling spout of the whale, and in the act of leaping, as if from a precipice. The action of the whole thing is wonderfully good and true. The half-emptied line tub floats on the whitened sea, the wooden poles of the spilled harpoons obliquely bob in it, the heads of the swimming crew are scattered about the whale in contrasting expressions of affright, while in the black stormy distance the ship is bearing down upon the scene. Serious fault might be found with the anatomical details of this whale, but let that pass, since, for the life of me, I could not draw so good a one. In the second engraving, the boat is in the act of drawing alongside the barnacled flank of a large running right whale, that rolls his black weedy bulk in the sea like some mossy rock slide from the Patagonian cliffs. His jets are erect, full, and black like soot, so that from so abounding a smoke in the chimney, you would think there must be a brave supper cooking in the great bowels below. Sea fowls are pecking at the small crabs, shellfish, and other sea candies and macaroni, which the right whale sometimes carries on his pestilent back. And all the while the thick-lipped leviathan is rushing through the deep, leaving tons of tumultuous white curds in his wake, and causing the slight boat to rock in the swells like a skiff caught nigh the paddle wheels of an ocean steamer. Thus, the foreground is all raging commotion, but behind, in admirable artistic contrast, is the glassy level of a sea becalmed, the drooping unstarched sails of the powerless ship, and the inert mass of a dead whale, a conquered fortress, with the flag of capture lazily hanging from the whale pole inserted into his spout hole. Who Garnery the painter is, or was, I know not. But my life for it he was either practically conversant with his subject, or else marvelously tutored by some experienced whaleman. The French are the lads for painting action. Go and gaze upon all the paintings of Europe, and where will you find such a gallery of living and breathing commotion on canvas, as in that triumphal hall at Versailles, where the beholder fights his way, pell-mell, through the consecutive great battles of France, where every sword seems a flash of the northern lights, and the successive armed kings and emperors dash by, like a charge of crown centaurs? Not wholly unworthy of a place in that gallery, are these sea battle pieces of garnery. The natural aptitude of the French for seizing the picturesqueness of things seems to be peculiarly evinced in what paintings and engravings they have of their whaling scenes. With not one-tenth of England's experience in the fishery, and not the thousandth part of that of the Americans, they have nevertheless furnished both nations with the only finished sketches at all capable of conveying the real spirit of the whale hunt. For the most part, the English and American whale draftsmen seem entirely content with presenting the mechanical outline of things, such as the vacant profile of the whale which, so far as picturesqueness of effect is concerned, is about tantamount to sketching the profile of a pyramid. 
Even Scoresby, the justly renowned right whale man, after giving us a stiff full length of the Greenland whale, and three or four delicate miniatures of narwhals and porpoises, treats us to a series of classical engravings of boat hooks, chopping knives, and grapnels, and with the microscopic diligence of a Lewenhoek submits to the inspection of a shivering world 96 FAC similes of magnified Arctic snow crystals. I mean no disparagement to the excellent voyager, I honor him for a veteran, but in so important a matter it was certainly an oversight not to have procured for every crystal a sworn affidavit taken before a Greenland justice of the peace. In addition to those fine engravings from Garnery, there are two other French engravings worthy of note, by someone who subscribes himself H. Durand. One of them, though not precisely adapted to our present purpose, nevertheless deserves mention on other accounts. It is a quiet noon scene among the Isles of the Pacific, a French whaler anchored, inshore, in a calm, and lazily taking water on board, the loosened sails of the ship, and the long leaves of the palms in the background, both drooping together in the breezeless air. The effect is very fine, when considered with reference to its presenting the hardy fishermen under one of their few aspects of oriental repose. The other engraving is quite a different affair, the ship hove to upon the open sea, and in the very heart of the Leviathanic life, with a right whale alongside, the vessel, in the act of cutting in, hove over to the monster as if to a quay, and a boat, hurriedly pushing off from this scene of activity, is about giving chase to whales in the distance. The harpoons and lances lie leveled for use, three oarsmen are just setting the mast in its hole, while from a sudden roll of the sea, the little craft stands half erect out of the water, like a rearing horse. From the ship, the smoke of the torments of the boiling whale is going up like the smoke over a village of smithies, and to windward, a black cloud, rising up with earnest of squalls and rains, seems to quicken the activity of the excited seamen. Chapter 57 of whales in paint, in teeth, in wood, in sheet iron, in stone, in mountains, in stars. On Tower Hill, as you go down to the London docks, you may have seen a crippled beggar, or kedger, as the sailors say, holding a painted board before him, representing the tragic scene in which he lost his leg. There are three whales and three boats, and one of the boats, presumed to contain the missing leg in all its original integrity, is being crunched by the jaws of the foremost whale. Any time these ten years, they tell me, has that man held up that picture and exhibited that stump to an incredulous world. But the time of his justification has now come. His three whales are as good whales as were ever published in Wapping, at any rate, and his stump as unquestionable a stump as any you will find in the western clearings. But, though forever mounted on that stump, never a stump speech does the poor whaleman make, but, with downcast eyes, stands ruefully contemplating his own amputation. Throughout the Pacific, and also in Nantucket, and New Bedford, and Sag Harbor, you will come across lively sketches of whales and whaling scenes, graven by the fishermen themselves on sperm whale teeth, or ladies' busks wrought out of the right whalebone, and other like scrimshander articles, as the whalemen call the numerous little ingenious contrivances they elaborately carve out of the rough material, in their hours of ocean leisure. Some of them have little boxes of dentistical-looking implements, specially intended for the scrimshandering business. But, in general, they toil with their jackknives alone, and, with that almost omnipotent tool of the sailor, they will turn you out anything you please, in the way of a mariner's fancy. Long exile from Christendom and civilization inevitably restores a man to that condition in which God placed him, i.e. what is called savagery. Your true whale hunter is as much a savage as an Iroquois. I myself am a savage, owning no allegiance but to the king of the cannibals, and ready at any moment to rebel against him. Now, one of the peculiar characteristics of the savage in his domestic hours is his wonderful patience of industry. An ancient Hawaiian war club or spear paddle, in its full multiplicity and elaboration of carving, is as great a trophy of human perseverance as a Latin lexicon. For, with but a bit of broken seashell or a shark's tooth, that miraculous intricacy of wooden network has been achieved, and it has cost steady years of steady application. As with the Hawaiian savage, so with the white sailor savage. With the same marvelous patience, and with the same single shark's tooth of his one poor jackknife, he will carve you a bit of bone sculpture, not quite as workmanlike, but as close packed in its maziness of design, as the Greek savage, Achilles' shield, and full of barbaric spirit and suggestiveness, as the prince of that fine old Dutch savage, Albert Durer. Wooden whales, or whales cut in profile out of the small dark slabs of the noble South Sea warwood, are frequently met with in the forecastles of American whalers. Some of them are done with much accuracy. At some old gable-roofed country houses you will see brass whales hung by the tail for knockers to the roadside door. 
When the porter is sleepy, the anvil-headed whale would be best. But these knocking whales are seldom remarkable as faithful essays. On the spires of some old-fashioned churches you will see sheet-iron whales placed there for weathercocks, but they are so elevated, and besides that are to all intents and purposes so labeled with hands off, you cannot examine them closely enough to decide upon their merit. In bony, ribby regions of the earth, where at the base of high broken cliffs masses of rock lie strewn in fantastic groupings upon the plain, you will often discover images as of the petrified forms of the leviathan partly merged in grass, which of a windy day breaks against them in a surf of green surges. Then, again, in mountainous countries where the traveler is continually girdled by amphitheatrical heights, here and there from some lucky point of view you will catch passing glimpses of the profiles of whales defined along the undulating ridges. But you must be a thorough whaleman to see these sights, and not only that, but if you wish to return to such a site again, you must be sure and take the exact intersecting latitude and longitude of your first standpoint, else so chance-like are such observations of the hills, that your precise, previous standpoint would require a laborious rediscovery, like the Saloma Islands, which still remain incognita, though once high-ruffed Mendana trod them and old Figuera chronicled them. Nor when expandingly lifted by your subject, can you fail to trace out great whales in the starry heavens, and boats in pursuit of them, as when long filled with thoughts of war the eastern nations saw armies locked in battle among the clouds. Thus at the north have I chased Leviathan round and round the pole with the revolutions of the bright points that first defined him to me. And beneath the effulgent Antarctic skies I have boarded the Argonavis, and joined the chase against the starry Cetus far beyond the utmost stretch of Hydrus and the flying fish. With a frigate's anchors for my bridle bits and fasces of harpoons for spurs, would I could mount that whale and leap the topmost skies, to see whether the fabled heavens with all their countless tents really lie encamped beyond my mortal sight. Chapter 58 Brit Steering northeastward from the Crossets, we fell in with vast meadows of Brit, the minute, yellow substance, upon which the right whale largely feeds. For leagues and leagues it undulated round us, so that we seemed to be sailing through boundless fields of ripe and golden wheat. On the second day, numbers of right whales were seen, who, secure from the attack of a sperm whaler like the Pequod, with open jaws sluggishly swam through the Brit, which, adhering to the fringing fibers of that wondrous Venetian blind in their mouths, was in that manner separated from the water that escaped at the lip. As morning mowers, who side by side slowly and seethingly advanced their sides through the long wet grass of marshy meats, even so these monsters swam, making a strange, grassy, cutting sound, and leaving behind them endless swaths of blue upon the yellow sea, asterisk. Asterisk that part of the sea known among whalemen as the Brazil Banks does not bear that name as the Banks of Newfoundland do, because of their being shallows and soundings there, but because of this remarkable metal-like appearance, caused by the vast drifts of Brit continually floating in those latitudes, where the right whale is often chased. But it was only the sound they made as they parted the Brit which it all reminded one of moors. Seen from the mastheads, especially when they paused and were stationary for a while, their vast black forms looked more like lifeless masses of rock than anything else. And as in the great hunting countries of India, the stranger at a distance will sometimes pass on the plains recumbent elephants without knowing them to be such, taking them for bare, blackened elevations of the soil, even so, often, with him, who for the first time beholds this species of the leviathans of the sea. And even when recognized at last, their immense magnitude renders it very hard really to believe that such bulky masses of overgrowth can possibly be instinct, in all parts, with the same sort of life that lives in a dog or a horse. Indeed, in other respects, you can hardly regard any creatures of the deep with the same feelings that you do those of the shore. For though some old naturalists have maintained that all creatures of the land are of their kind in the sea, and though taking a broad general view of the thing, this may very well be, yet coming to specialties, where, for example, does the ocean furnish any fish that in disposition answers to the sagacious kindness of the dog? The accursed shark alone can in any generic respect be said to bear comparative analogy to him. But though, to landsmen in general, the native inhabitants of the seas have ever been regarded with emotions unspeakably unsocial and repelling, though we know the sea to be an everlasting terra incognita, so that Columbus sailed over numberless unknown worlds to discover his one superficial western one, though, by vast odds, the most terrific of all mortal disasters have immemorially and indiscriminately befallen tens and hundreds of thousands of those who have gone upon the waters, though but. A moment's consideration will teach that however baby man may brag of his science and skill, and however much, in a flattering future, that science and skill may augment, 
yet forever and forever, to the crack of doom, the sea will insult and murder him, and pulverize the stateliest, stiffest frigate he can make, nevertheless, by the continual repetition of these very impressions, man has lost that sense of the full awfulness of the sea which aboriginally belongs to it. The first boat we read of, floated on an ocean, that with Portuguese vengeance had whelmed the whole world without leaving so much as a widow. That same ocean rolls now, that same ocean destroyed the wrecked ships of last year. Yeah, foolish mortals, Noah's flood is not yet subsided, two-thirds of the fair world it yet covers. Wherein differ the sea and the land, that a miracle upon one is not a miracle upon the other? Preternatural terrors rested upon the Hebrews, when under the feet of Korah and his company the live ground opened and swallowed them up forever, yet not a modern sun ever sets, but in precisely the same manner the live sea swallows up ships and crews. But not only is the sea such a photo man who is an alien to it, but it is also a fiend to its own offspring, worse than the Persian host who murdered his own guests, sparing not the creatures which itself hath spawned. Like a savage tigress that tossing in the jungle overlays her own cubs, so the sea dashes even the mightiest whales against the rocks, and leaves them there side by side with the split wrecks of ships. No mercy, no power, but its own controls it. Panting and snorting like a mad battle steed that has lost its rider, the masterless ocean overruns the globe. Consider the subtleness of the sea, how its most dreaded creatures glide under water, unapparent for the most part, and treacherously hidden beneath the loveliest tints of azure. Consider also the devilish brilliance and beauty of many of its most remorseless tribes, as the dainty embellished shape of many species of sharks. Consider, once more, the universal cannibalism of the sea, all whose creatures prey upon each other, carrying on eternal war since the world began. Consider all this, and then turn to this green, gentle, and most docile earth, consider them both, the sea and the land, and do you not find a strange analogy to something in yourself? For as this appalling ocean surrounds the verdant land, so in the soul of man there lies one insular Tahiti, full of peace and joy, but encompassed by all the horrors of the half-known life. God keep thee. Push not off from that isle, thou canst never return. Chapter 59 Squid Slowly wading through the meadows of Brit, the Pequod still held on her way northeastward towards the island of Java, a gentle air impelling her keel, so that in the surrounding serenity her three tall tapering masts mildly waved to that languid breeze, as three mild palms on a plain. And still, at wide intervals in the silvery night, the lonely, alluring jet would be seen. But one transparent blue morning, when a stillness almost preternatural spread over the sea, however unattended with any stagnant calm, when the long burnished sunblade on the waters seemed a golden finger laid across them, enjoining some secrecy, when the slippered waves whispered together as they softly ran on, in this profound hush of the visible sphere a strange specter was seen by Degu from the main masthead. In the distance, a great white mass lazily rose, and rising higher and higher, and disentangling itself from the azure, at last gleamed before our prow like a snowslide, new slid from the hills. Thus glistening for a moment, as slowly it subsided, and sank. Then once more arose, and silently gleamed. It seemed not a whale, and yet is this Moby Dick? Thought Degu. Again the phantom went down, but on reappearing once more, with a stiletto-like cry that startled every man from his nod, the negro yelled out there. There again. There she breaches. Right ahead. The white whale, the white whale. Upon this, the seamen rushed to the yardarms, as in swarming time the bees rushed to the bows. Bareheaded in the sultry sun, Ahab stood on the bowsprit, and with one hand pushed far behind in readiness to wave his orders to the helmsman, cast his eager glance in the direction indicated aloft by the outstretched motionless arm of Degu. Whether the flitting attendants of the one still and solitary jet had gradually worked upon Ahab, so that he was now prepared to connect the ideas of mildness and repose with the first sight of the particular whale he pursued, however this was, or whether his eagerness betrayed him, whichever way it might have been, no sooner did he distinctly perceive the white mass, than with a quick intensity he instantly gave orders for lowering. The four boats were soon on the water, Ahab's in advance, and all swiftly pulling towards their prey. Soon it went down, and while, with oars suspended, we were awaiting its reappearance, lo! In the same spot where it sank, once more it slowly rose. Almost forgetting for the moment all thoughts of Moby Dick, we now gazed at the most wondrous phenomenon which the secret seas have hitherto revealed to mankind. 
A vast pulpy mass, furlongs in length and breadth, of a glancing cream color, lay floating on the water, innumerable long arms radiating from its center, and curling and twisting like a nest of anacondas, as if blindly to clutch at any hapless object within reach. No perceptible face or front did it have, no conceivable token of either sensation or instinct, but undulated there on the billows, an unearthly, formless, chance-like apparition of life. As with a low sucking sound it slowly disappeared again, Starbuck still gazing at the agitated waters where it had sunk, with a wild voice exclaimed, almost rather had I seen Moby Dick and fought him, than to have seen thee, the white ghost. What was it, sir, said Flask? The great live squid, which, they say, few whale ships ever beheld, and returned to their ports to tell of it. But Ahab said nothing, turning his boat, he sailed back to the vessel, the rest as silently following. Whatever superstitions the sperm whalemen in general have connected with the sight of this object, certain it is, that a glimpse of it being so very unusual, that circumstance has gone far to invest it with portentousness. So rarely is it beheld, that the one and all of them declare it to be the largest animated thing in the ocean, yet very few of them have any but the most vague ideas concerning its true nature and form, notwithstanding, they believe it to furnish to the sperm whale his only food. For though other species of whales find their food above water, and may be seen by man in the act of feeding, the spermaceti whale obtains his whole food in unknown zones below the surface, and only by inference is it that anyone can tell of what, precisely, that food consists. At times, when closely pursued, he will disgorge what are supposed to be the detached arms of the squid, some of them thus exhibited exceeding twenty and thirty feet in length. They fancy that the monster to which these arms belonged ordinarily clings by them to the bed of the ocean, and that the sperm whale, unlike other species, is supplied with teeth in order to attack and tear it. There seems some ground to imagine that the great kraken of Bishop Pontopodon may ultimately resolve itself into squid. The manner in which the bishop describes it, as alternately rising and sinking, with some other particulars he narrates, in all this the two correspond. But much abatement is necessary with respect to the incredible bulk he assigns it. By some naturalists who have vaguely heard rumors of the mysterious creature, here spoken of, it is included among the class of cuttlefish, to which, indeed, in certain external respects it would seem to belong, but only as the anic of the tribe. Chapter 60 The Line With reference to the whaling scene shortly to be described, as well as for the better understanding of all similar scenes elsewhere presented, I have here to speak of the magical, sometimes horrible whale line. The line originally used in the fishery was of the best hemp, slightly vapored with tar, not impregnated with it, as in the case of ordinary ropes, for while tar, as ordinarily used, makes the hemp more pliable to the rope maker, and also renders the rope itself more convenient to the sailor for common ship use, yet, not only would the ordinary quantity too much stiffen the whale line for the close coiling to which it must be subjected, but as most seamen are beginning to learn, tar in general. By no means adds to the rope's durability or strength, however much it may give it compactness and gloss. Of late years the manila rope has in the American fishery almost entirely superseded hemp as a material for whale lines, for, though not so durable as hemp, it is stronger, and far more soft and elastic, and I will add, since there is an aesthetics in all things, is much more handsome and becoming to the boat, than hemp. Hemp is a dusky, dark fellow, a sort of Indian, but manila is as a golden-haired Circassian to behold. The whale line is only two-thirds of an inch in thickness. At first sight, you would not think it so strong as it really is. By experiment it's one in fifty yarns will each suspend a weight of 120 pounds, so that the whole rope will bear a strain nearly equal to three tons. In length, the common sperm whale line measures something over 200 fathoms. Towards the stern of the boat it is spirally coiled away in the tub, not like the worm pipe of a still though, but so as to form one round, chi-shaped mass of densely bedded sheaves, or layers of concentric spiralizations, without any hollow but the heart, or minute vertical tube formed at the axis of the cheese. As the least tangle or kink in the coiling would, in running out, infallibly take somebody's arm, leg, or entire body off, the utmost precaution is used in stowing the line in its tub. Some harpooners will consume almost an entire morning in this business, carrying the line high aloft and then reaving it downwards through a block towards the tub, so as in the act of coiling to free it from all possible wrinkles and twists. In the English boats two tubs are used instead of one, the same line being continuously coiled in both tubs. There is some advantage in this, because these twin tubs being so small they fit more readily into the boat and do not strain it so much, whereas, the American tub, nearly three feet in diameter and of proportionate depth, 
makes a rather bulky freight for a craft whose planks are but one half inch in thickness, for the bottom of the whaleboat is like critical ice, which will bear up a considerable distributed weight, but not very much of a concentrated one. When the painted canvas cover is clapped on the American line tub, the boat looks as if it were pulling off with a prodigious great wedding cake to present to the whales. Both ends of the line are exposed, the lower end terminating in an eye splice or loop coming up from the bottom against the side of the tub, and hanging over its edge completely disengaged from everything. This arrangement of the lower end is necessary on two accounts. First, in order to facilitate the fastening to it of an additional line from a neighboring boat, in case the stricken whale should sound so deep as to threaten to carry off the entire line originally attached to the harpoon. In these instances, the whale of course is shifted like a mug of ale, as it were, from the one boat to the other, though the first boat always hovers at hand to assist its consort. Second, this arrangement is indispensable for common safety's sake, for were the lower end of the line in any way attached to the boat, and were the whale then to run the line out to the end almost in a single, smoking minute as he sometimes does, he would not stop there, for the doomed boat would infallibly be dragged down after him into the profundity of the sea, and in that case no town crier would ever find her again. Before lowering the boat for the chase, the upper end of the line is taken aft from the tub, and passing round the loggerhead there, is again carried forward the entire length of the boat, resting crosswise upon the loom or handle of every man's oar, so that it jogs against his wrist in rowing, and also passing between the men, as they alternately sit at the opposite gunnels, to the leaded chocks or grooves in the extreme pointed prow of the boat, where a wooden pin or skewer the size of a common quill prevents it from slipping out. From the chocks it hangs in a slight festoon over the bows, and is then passed inside the boat again, and some ten or twenty fathoms, called box line, being coiled upon the box in the bows, it continues its way to the gunwale still a little further aft, and is then attached to the short warp, the rope which is immediately connected with the harpoon, but previous to that connection, the short warp goes through sundry mystifications too tedious to detail. Thus the whale line folds the whole boat in its complicated coils, twisting and writhing around it in almost every direction. All the oarsmen are involved in its perilous contortions, so that to the timid eye of the landsmen, they seem as Indian jugglers, with the deadliest snakes sportively festooning their limbs. Nor can any son of mortal woman, for the first time, seat himself amid those hempen intricacies, and while straining his utmost at the oar, bethink him that at any unknown instant the harpoon may be darted, and all these horrible contortions be put in play like ringed lightnings, he cannot be thus circumstanced without a shudder that makes the very marrow in his bones to quiver in him like a shaken jelly. Yet habit, strange thing. What cannot habit accomplish, you gayer sallies, more merry mirth, better jokes, and brighter repartees, you never heard over your mahogany, than you will hear over the half-inch white cedar of the whaleboat, when thus hung in hangman's nooses, and, like the six burghers of Calais before King Edward, the six men composing the crew pull into the jaws of death, with a halter around every neck, as you may say. Perhaps a very little thought will now enable you to account for those repeated whaling disasters some few of which are casually chronicled of this man or that man being taken out of the boat by the line and lost. For, when the line is darting out, to be seated then in the boat is like being seated in the midst of the manifold whizzings of a steam engine in full play, when every flying beam and shaft and wheel is grazing you. It is worse, for you cannot sit motionless in the heart of these perils, because the boat is rocking like a cradle, and you are pitched one way and the other, without the slightest warning, and only by a certain self-adjusting buoyancy and simultaneousness of volition and action, can you escape being made a mazep of, and run away with where the all-seeing sun himself could never pierce you out. Again, as the profound calm which only apparently precedes and prophesies of the storm, is perhaps more awful than the storm itself, for, indeed, the calm is but the wrapper and envelope of the storm, and contains it in itself, as the seemingly harmless rifle holds the fatal powder, and the ball, and the explosion, so the graceful repose of the line, as it silently serpentines about the oarsman before being brought into actual play, this is a thing which carries more of true terror than any other aspect of this dangerous affair. But why say more? All men live enveloped in whale lines. All are born with halters round their necks, but it is only when caught in the swift, sudden turn of death, that mortals realize the silent, subtle, ever-present perils of life. And if you be a philosopher, though seated in the whaleboat, you would not at heart feel one whit more of terror, than though seated before your evening fire with a poker, and not a harpoon, by your side.